Okay, maybe we should go ahead and get started. I was just watching all of the numbers climb for our participants. Welcome everyone to session four, the first of two sessions on ecology and evolutionary genomics. And so the idea is that we actually have really great breadth uh, taxonomically in the talks coming up. Being arthropod, it's truly also crustaceans and others, not only insects. And in fact, thinking about a broader ecological perspective, we're also going to be spanning kingdoms a little bit, thinking also about bacteria and others that constitute the larger ecosystem of the individual species, as it were. Okay, so a couple of housekeeping points for getting started. Hopefully you can all see in the chat window a couple of guidelines for getting started. We've had excellent participation this entire time through with the previous sessions. We definitely want to hear from all of you and have questions for our speakers. To do so, please specifically use the Q&A, which is a little um, icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. Those questions will then appear in a sidebar. That way we can actually keep track of the questions and people who have similar questions can upvote a question that's already there. The aim is that if speakers have time, we'll first um, ask questions directly at the end of the individual talks. Um, depending on how timing is going to keep everything running, we also have a dedicated question and answer session at the end of this group of talks um, with a good 15 minutes. But because we've had so many questions, we have yet a third option and we're collecting all of the questions received and those that we don't discuss verbally now will go into a dedicated channel on Slack. And that way, at people's leisure, the speakers can go have a look and give written responses. And there have been some excellent threads developing with questions arising from the sessions yesterday. Just to give you a feeling for how things are going, um, we have over 1,300 people who registered for this meeting. As of the end of yesterday, we'd seen definite activity from getting on towards about 1,000 people so far. Attendance at all of the sessions has been really great. And in addition to all of our excellent speakers, do take a look at the virtual posters, where earlier today I saw we already had 70 different posters, where people have variously a complete poster you can read or links to external Google Docs and other material, and in some cases, Jitsi breakout rooms. So I've been having a great time with all of the activity throughout this whole meeting. We're right in the heart of things, starting our middle session, session number four. Rob, anything else to comment on? I think you've covered absolutely everything and we are perfectly on time. Excellent. So we've already gone past 150 participants. That's still climbing. And I'm very happy to briefly introduce the first speaker, Isabel Almudi, who will be starting us off with something on the mayflies and thinking about paleoptera, if I can use that term. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Don't forget to unmute. And when you're ready to go ahead with sharing your screen and go into presenter mode. Oops, we've lost it. And you're still muted, actually. Trying again. Mm -hmm. That's looking good. Uh, uh, can, you, uh, can you hear me? Definitely. Go okay, yep. sorry. You're okay, good to sorry. go now. Whoops. Sorry. Okay, so good afternoon and good morning, everyone. So um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Rob and Kristen to inviting me to give an overview of the work we are doing with mayflies. Uh, so in the, in the laboratory, we are interested in understanding how uh, the genetic basis of uh, morphological novelties and for that, we are using the mayfly cleon term as a model organism. So why mayflies? So first of all, uh, they are ephemeroptera and together with odonata, they are the sister group to all other wing insects. So they are key to understand the origin of wings. Uh, second, uh, cleon dipterum belongs to the family of uh, betidae, which uh, this uh, family of mayflies has a striking sexual dimorphism. So this is the female, as you saw in the previous slide. And here in a higher magnification of the head, you can see the compound eyes and the three ocelli that are typical of insects. But if, we, if, we, if you look at the male on top of the compound eyes and the ocelli, it has an extra pair of eyes, which are these uh, structures here that are, are, sorry, that are called the turbinate eyes due to this uh, turban shape. 
And finally, they are also interested in, uh, to understand adaptations to different environments as uh, the nymphs are aquatic, so they live in freshwater streams or ponds, whereas the adults are flying insects. So for all of these reasons, uh, we decided to explore the genome of uh, Cleondipterum. So we sequence uh, the genomic DNA using two strategies, the Illumina and Nanopore, and we also sequence uh, several uh, samples of RNA. Uh, you, uh, these samples uh, come from different developmental stages or different tissues or organs uh, from memes or adults. And why we did that? So first, we, we wanted to, to have these RNA uh, samples to help with the annotation of the genome, but also because we were interested in understanding uh, different profiles of gene expression across these uh, different samples. So one of the first things we did uh, was to, to use this uh, MFAS uh, soft clustering analysis, which uh, give us clusters of genes that uh, are uh, co-expressed, for example, in this case, uh, along the life cycle of the mayfly. So this is just one example, and here you can see one of those clusters that ha uh, contains genes that are uh, expressed during the embryonic stages, but not during the nymphal or the adulthood. So this uh, type of analysis gives us uh, different clusters with different profiles, and then when that, what we decided was to focus on uh, the transition between the aquatic and the terrestrial uh, uh, clusters. So here uh, you can see this is one cluster with genes that are highly expressed during the nymphal stages and this is the other cluster with genes with high expression uh, during the adulthood. And uh, here what we did was a, a geo gerontology term enrichment to see which type of genes were those. And for, the, for these aquatic uh, clusters what we found is an enrichment in terms related with uh, sensory perception of chemical stimuli or odor and binding, whereas uh, when we look at the, at the terms enriched in the, in the adult clusters, what we found was an enrichment in visual perception. So one of the things that we like to say in the lab is that the, the nymphs smell the, their environment while the adults just see. So we wanted to, to go a bit more into the details of the, of the chemoperception of, uh, of the mayflies. And for that, so there are several things that we, take, we have to take into account first. So first is that the, the transition from water to land really requires uh, physiological, anatomical and molecular adaptations in the chemosensory systems. And in the case of insects, what happens is that there are two of the gene, the chemosensory gene families, the odorant binding proteins uh, and the odorant uh, receptor gene uh, family that appear for the first time in insects. So odorant binding proteins appear in, in the hexapoda lineage and odorant receptors appear in insecta. So these two gene families uh, have been thought that uh, appear as an adaptation to the terrestrial life of insects in contrast to crustacea. So what happens with uh, Cleondipterum? So we went back to our MFAS uh, soft clustering and we observed that most of the chemosensory genes were mainly located in four different clusters. And when we look the type of clusters that those were, we found that three of them were uh, clusters with genes that were highly expressed during the nymphal aquatic stages, whereas the fourth one is a cluster with genes that are highly expressed in the last embryonic stage, where the nymphs or well, the embryos are about to hatch into the water. So this is already suggesting that they have a role or at least that they are expressed uh, in, in the aquatic uh, stages of the, of the mayfly. So we wanted to, so as we have also uh, particular organs and, and, and tissues, we also check the expression of uh, some of these uh, gene families in, in the organs. And here you can see the other binding protein uh, gene family. And what we observe is that most of them were highly expressed in nymphal heads, again, aquatic nymphal heads. But there were a second tissue in which we, we found an enrichment of these uh, other binding proteins. And this tissue, are the gills, the gill plates, which is an organ that has been always um, proposed as being uh, uh, the respiratory organ of the nymphs. 
So here what we are observing is that it's not only, at least not only a respiratory organ, but also a sensory organ. And in fact, when we look the, the expression of some of these odorant binding proteins uh, using in situ hybridization assays, uh, we see that the, these uh, genes are expressed throughout the, the entire gill plate and that this expression co-localized with the neural marker HRP, showing or really strongly suggesting that the, these, these uh, gill plates also function as a sensory organ. So that was uh, what we found regarding the, the chemoperception in, may, in nymphs, but what happens with, with the adults and the vision. So um, there are in insects, there are three main uh, light, some, light, some, sorry, light sensing uh, molecules, uh, opsins, and those are the long wave sensitive opsin, the blue sensitive opsin, and the ultraviolet or UV sensitive opsin. And in the different lineages of insects, uh, these uh, gene families uh, have under, uh, undergone different expansions or reduction independently in the different lineages. So what happens to cleon dipterum? So what we observe here is that, so there is also an expansion of the long wave sensitive opsins, which is quite uh, common in, 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 in other lineages. But what was interesting here was that we found that it, it's also duplicated uh, the blue uh, sensitive opsin and most importantly, the UV uh, sensitive opsin. And actually with four copies, this is the largest expansion described in, in insects so far. So we look a bit more into the, um, into the evolutionary scenario of these duplications. And what we observe is that the long wave sensitive opsin's uh, duplication was ancestral to all mayflies, uh, whereas the, the UV uh, the UV sensitive opsin duplication was ancestral to the Betidae family. And if you remember from my first slides, one of the characteristics of the Betidae family is the Chorbanet eye. So by then, what our hypothesis was or started to be that probably this, um, this duplication of opsins uh, had something to do with the appearance of this new, of this new organ. To test that, what we did was uh, to do a differential gene expression analysis uh, using uh, female heads and, and male heads as the female don't have turbanet eyes. And what we observe is that the genes, the two genes that are mostly upregulated in the males are one of these blue opsins and one of the UV opsins showing that those uh, opsins are uh, male specific, but are they turbinate eye specific? They are. Uh, we check uh, using again in situ hybridization and we observe that uh, the UV opsin 4 is expressed in the turbinate eye of the males, but is not expressed in the compound eye of the males or in the compound eye of the female. So finally, I want to, so as I said at the beginning, uh, mayflies are key to understand the origin of wings. And for that, we, we use another type of uh, clustering analysis, WGCNA, which give us um, a cluster of genes that are expressed in a sort of tissue specific manner. And uh, so we did, oh, sorry, we did that uh, for uh, Cleon dipteron and also for Drosophila melanogaster. And then what we did was to do pairwise comparisons to, to see the similarities in, in the genes that are located in the different clusters that we obtained with this analysis. So this is the pairwise comparison. And here we have the different clusters for the two species. And what was interesting here is that the, the cluster, the, the, the wind cluster in, 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 in mayflies, uh, show the highest similarity with the Windis cluster in Drosophila, suggesting or indicating a, a conservation in gene, trans, in, in gene transcription. And actually, from those 126 uh, ortholog genes that are shared in these uh, two modules, some of them have a known function in wind development, but uh, some others uh, have an unknown function. So we decided to test uh, some of those unknown uh, genes. And for that, we did a uh, knockdown experiments using Drosophila melanogaster and the, the UIS GAR4 system. And when, when we knocked down some, well, actually, when we knocked down all the genes we tested, that in this case were eight different genes, in all of the cases, 
we found wind phenotypes. So this conservation is not only a, a conservation in the, in, in the transcriptional activity, but probably it's also a conservation in function. Uh, but actually this is uh, something related to the conservation of transcription, but what, what happens with the origin of WIMS? And for that, I'm not going to go into the details of the different hypotheses that are, are there uh, trying to explain how WIMS appear for the first time, but in one of the, one of the hypotheses suggests that probably the WIMS and the gill plates in mayflies are serial, serially homologous structures. So we, we wanted to do a first approximate, transcriptomical ad, approximation to this problem and for that uh, we did again another type of uh, clustering and here uh, clustering all the transcriptomes we, we, we observe that the wings, uh, the wing transcriptomes cluster together with the gill transcriptome giving another piece of, evi of evidence that probably those, uh, those uh, tissues are related and moreover we also uh, did another uh, analysis in which we checked the genes that were highly expressed in wings and in an additional tissue. And what we caught is that from the 98 genes that were highly expressed in the wings, the second tissue in, in 42 of the cases, the second tissue uh, was the gills. Suggesting that so they share uh, common genetic programs and that probably, but this is something that we need to test further, that probably they share a common origin. And for that, so for today, this is all. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Fernando Casares and the rest of the lab, especially the students that are now working with different aspects of uh, mayfly biology, development and evolution. And also, as you can imagine, so this is a genome project, so there were many people involved in different aspects of the project. So I want to thank them all, the funding bodies, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel, and for being on time as well. So that means we can give you one direct question, at least. Um, so we have uh, the first question here um, from Meg Allen, asking, do you have any insight on strategies and methods that you would use to characterize some of these uh, brand new genes that are unique to your study organism? Mm. A parenthetical comment from the questioner, I love mayflies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, actually, so I think this is just an open world that is now here because, so I think for, yeah, so we only have Cleon dipterum and ephemera, ephemer, 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 well, another mayfly, ephemera danica uh, species, the genome. So I think we will need uh, having uh, a bit more of species to really know which are the, so which are genes that are specific of mayflies. So at, at this point, having only one, I would love to sequence as many mayfly species uh, and probably with this Darwin Tree of Life project we will manage to do something but at this point it's a bit difficult to really see which are genes that are mayfly specific but yeah so I guess so there are many methods to try to do that actually part of the, the part of the project was to look for novel genes in the in the different lineages and so we have novel genes that are paleoptera specific or mayfly specific so we have some methods that we could check. Thank you, great. Um, I think uh, we'll move on to the next speaker now. Uh, and if I cut out, there's a big thunderstorm just happening right now. So <laughs> if you lose me, you just carry on without me. <laughs> we'll do our best. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to shift gears a little bit and look at a topic that might sound very traditional, but the more we look, the more differences we find in what are typically very highly conserved hox genes. Peter, we're very much looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. Yep. Okay, yep. well, first of all, um, thanks Kristen and Rob as chairs of this session, um, and also thanks the whole organizing committee for setting up this conference. I mean, I think over the past few months, um, most, of, of, most of us have been at virtual or online conferences and seminars. Um, and this one is about as smooth as it gets. So, you know, I think it's going really well. So what I want to do over the next um, 10 minutes or so is give you a sort of work in progress overview of a project that we haven't been working on for very long. 
Um, and it is, of course, related to the large Darwin Tree of Life project that you heard about yesterday from Lyndall Pereira and Mara Lornesak. So specifically, what I'm going to do in this talk is summarize the species sampling that um, we've been doing, and my colleagues and I in Oxford have been doing, um, to provide arthropod specimens for genome sequencing. And I also want to present some preliminary data analysis. So to start with, I need to introduce a little bit about Hox genes. So of course, Hox genes are really very well known um, to most people um, in biology as these, as these um, genes which are switched on, are arranged in particular in clusters, in genomic clusters, um, as shown here. And then they're switched on in the embryo um, in particular regions to sort of indicate to cells where they are along the head to tail axis. Um, however, we see these pictures very commonly in textbooks and review articles, but most of the articles, most of the pictures you see, not all of them, but most of them are very incomplete pictures because they've actually, genes have been missed out of these pictures. What's being shown on all these diagrams I've shown you are eight particular Hox genes in, in a Drosophila which are involved in this process. But there are other homeobox genes which are in fact actually Hox genes in the cluster of insects which have changed their function. Um, and the one I want to point out, and I've, I've circled them here, but the one I want to really point out is a gene called Zen. Zen is really the group three or the number three um, Hox gene along the cluster if we call this one labial um, expressed near the head, uh, towards in the head as group one, and then PB is group two. Zen is actually a group three Hox gene, but it's changed its function entirely in insects. And it's no longer involved in telling cells where they are along the head to tail axis, but it's involved in some as aspects of patterning extra embryonic tissues of insects. So that gene is going to become important for what I'm going to talk about later. And the reason I got interested in this was this very, um, well, I was excited to see this paper over 10 years ago when the Bombix Moray genome, silk moth genome, was published. Because in these first papers that came out about the Bombix genome, they showed a, an incredible expansion of the Hox gene cluster, which we hadn't seen elsewhere in the whole animal kingdom, where there'd been clearly tandem duplication of Hox genes within the cluster to give a very large array. Um, and the authors of this paper call these SHX genes, special homeobox genes, and they sit right next to Zen. It's important to note Zen is still there. The, the silk moth still has a Zen gene, but it has these additional um, highly divergent sequences, um, homeobox sequences within the cluster. So I need to introduce some older work that we did about six years ago. We wanted to investigate what the origin of those SHX genes was. And we used an approach which really you might call sequence skimming. So quite low coverage, short read, luminous sequencing of, of, of various genomes. The species are shown here, mostly Lepidoptera and one out group, a caddis fly. And we sequenced these at a, somewhere between about 8x and 15x coverage. So with short read sequences, we're not going to get a real assembly with that, but we are going to get, if you like, a good catalog of the genes that are present, even if we get fragmentary information. So this is older work, but from that older work, what we were able to show, because it, it gave us sequences from several different Lepidoptera, we were able to refine the, the relationships of some of these SHX genes and show that they can be divided into four basic families, which we called SHX A, B, C, and D. And you can see the expansions there in silk moth. Um, but this A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D SHX genes seem to be present across different Lepidoptera. But the problem with this analysis was, of course, that the species sampling here is quite light, not very species involved, and highly fragmentary information. There's lots of gaps in here. And this is where projects such as this Darwin Tree of Life project that you heard about yesterday can be so useful, because the, in this project, our intention in the first phase, the first three years of this project, um, which involves all these different organisations you can see here, is to sequence the genomes of 2,000 UK species. A large proportion of those will be arthropods. Um, and to make these data freely available for analysis. But these will be high quality genome sequences. 
which will, which will have high top contiguity um, and high coverage. Um, and we can start to address questions like this and many, many other questions using this information. So our particular role in my group within this project is sampling of terrestrial species, primarily arthropods, but not exclusively arthropods, from this area of woodland, which um, sits near Oxford in southern England. So Whiteham Wood is a 400 hectare woodland, so it's quite large, a mixture of ancient woodlands and, and some other habitats. And it's been a site of very long um, term ecological study uh, for many, many decades. And we're taking a sort of ecosystem approach here to sort of find the diversity is there, sample from this, um, and obtain a really good catalogue of species for genome sequencing. So what we're doing um, is collecting in various ways, of course, I'm just showing Lepidoptera here, so most of this is moth trapping, and some rearing as well, identifying, then samples are snap frozen, we're freezing on um, dry ice exclusively now because it works very, uh, we can um, use that much more simply than liquid nitrogen for snap freezing and still gives high, gives high quality DNA. And then our samples are shipped to the Sanger Institute um, for sequencing. And you heard about the sequencing pipeline and the sample um, tracking pipelines yesterday. So the sequence, they're being sequenced with long reads, short reads or linked reads and high C to assemble genomes. So where are we with the, with the sampling so far? Um, so this table just shows where we are from white and wood sampling particularly. This is not the whole Darwin Tree of Life project. This is just what we've collected from white and wood and have sent into the genome sequencing pipeline at the moment. So we're currently standing at 410 species or we were when I made this slide yesterday. Um, it's changed since then. So we can add 50, 56 more species to this, um, which Liam and Doug managed to collect yesterday. So the numbers are creeping up in that the arthropod diversity that we're able to collect, securely identify um, and then process, get processed for sequencing. And as you can see, close to oh, over 200 now Lepidoptera species. These are spread quite widely as you see by the orange dots across a taxonomic diversity of Lepidoptera and that's something we was really key to this project. We want to have wide taxonomic sampling because many of those have not yet reached the stage of assembly. So in terms of assembly, what I'm going to talk about now are 36 genome assemblies, which includes 17 moths that we've collected from white and wood and 19 butterfly genomes, um, which have been um, reared by um, other, other partners within the Darwin Tree of Life initiative. And I'm going to show you what we have found out from these in relation to Hox gene clusters. But of course, what I want to emphasize, I'll come back to that slide, what I want to emphasize is that these data can be used for many, many other questions as well. And we were interested in ecological and evolutionary adaptations. We want people to use them for mine for particular, let's say, bioactive molecules and new pathways. And of course, these should be reference genomes, baseline genomes to which transcriptomes, etc., um, can be mapped. So what I want to move on to very quickly now are the Hox clusters. So what you're looking at here, and I realize this is a very busy slide, is the organization of Hox genes in these 36 species that we've started to analyze. This is work by uh, Peter Mulher, postdoc in the group. I know you can't see a lot from this, but I'm gonna just pull out a few messages for you to see that we can see already. But first of all, first of all, of course, of course we're dealing here with clustered genes, genes that we know should be near each other in the genome. We can use them as a proxy, really, for how good the genome assemblies are. Because we, it's one thing getting a high N50, but if things are pieced together, if the jigsaw's pieced together in the wrong way, then it's rather meaningless. But actually, we can see from these that we're getting large stretches without broken contigs. The red dashes mean broken contigs. So on the whole, these are really... Um, we can look at the evolution of the genes themselves. And I just show you this radial tree to show you the fast evolution of these SHX genes. The arrows point to A, B, C, and D and showing their long, very long branch length is, lengths and faster evolution compared to normal Hox genes that you can see over here. For instance, let's look at, for instance, ABDB there where these branch lengths are almost all zero. And then these ones have got long branch, branch lengths. 
But having said that they're fast evolving, for most of the species we look at, we don't have any difficulty classifying these genes into those four families. There are a couple of exceptions, which I won't have time to go into. But what we can do is deduce what I might call a normal um, Hox cluster for Lepidoptera. And that's what I'm showing you here. This is, a, this is what we see in most of the species. I'm showing it here just to show intergenic distances for one species, Photographer gamus, silver wine moth, and you can see the organization here. This is all in one contig. Um, there's a large seven megabase distance between these two, presumably many other genes in between, non-Hox genes. But this is the organization. You can see the SHX genes there. Let me just pull out a couple of features that we see in this cluster. First of all, labial is at the wrong end. Labial, it, which is the Choralogy group one gene, should be, in most of the animal kingdom, sitting next to proboscopedia. In Lepidoptera, it isn't. It sits at the other end. Now, it's been known for a long time that it's not closely linked to the rest of the cluster, but we now have clear evidence in many species that it's actually at the ABDB end of the cluster. I also want to point out another homeobox gene, Ruff, which is involved in eye development, has been brought into the cluster. Presumably, this is all part of a large inversion that has happened that's moved labial away and brought Ruff in. Although that position of rough is not stable, and we have found exceptions. So in the, the white butterflies, Pyrrhus genus specifically, rough has moved again. So there's been another inversion to bring rough next to ABDB over here. Um, that's specifically within that genus, uh, but consistent within that genus. Gene losses do seem very rare. And of course, having high quality genomes allows us to look at gene losses, which are hard to do with low quality genomes. But one of these SHX genes, D, is lost in the blue butterflies, the Lycenids, in all of them. Um, there's a few dramatic Hox cluster expansions where there's been enormous amounts of tandem duplication. We're really interested in these. We don't have good answers for what's going on here. Stop there with just a few conclusions and, um, to make. I'm not going to run through the scientific conclusions which are shown here. Advice for other people doing this sort of work. Clearly long read assemblies we've heard from a lot of people, really impressive. I want to highlight this, that actually having genomes of close to related species has really helps us tell the difference between something that might be what we call real and something which could be an artifact. Um, and I need to acknowledge specifically um, Liam Crowley and um, Douglas Boyd, who've been doing a lot of the collecting Amber Harper and Peter Mulhair who've been doing a lot of the analysis and I need to of course thank all the members of the Darwin Tree of Life project um, who are shown here because this is a large collaborative project. Thank you. Thank you very much Peter. Um, if you can answer this with uh, yes or no and uh, a fuller perhaps answer later because we are two minutes over at the moment. Um, so at the end there, you talked about uh, having closely related species to be more confident about some of these rearrangements. Um, in previous uh, publications even, we've seen um, claims of completely atomized Hox gene clusters in some weird species. Yes or no, do you believe them? <laughs> yes, I do. You do believe them. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll expand further in Slack. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Talk about so. a teaser answer. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, great, thank you so much. All right, we're going to stick with the holo metabola, but shift gears a little bit into Hymenoptera. And Sushma Krishnan is going to tell us about big wasps, please. So, uh, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you, organizers, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to meet you all and give my work here. And I'm going to talk about chemical communication between fig and fig wasp. So this is the fig tree, Ficus racemosa, and these are the figs. Uh, these are the cyconia, which acts as a host for the pollinator fig wasp, Ceratosolan fusiceps. So we, we are interested in fig fig wasp mutualism because of uh, several uh, uh, important reasons. They have 80 million old, year old obligatory mutualism and co-evolution and nearly 800 uh, fig species are associated with a specific pollinator. And this has emerging as an important model in chemical ecology. And uh, fig and fig wasp has a beautiful relationship. During the pollen receptive phase, the female foundress enters into the osteol of the cyconia. 
After entry, it lays uh, its egg and pollinate the fig florescence. During the developmental phase, the eggs hatch and the male and the female wasps emerge from the egg mate. So during the wasp dispersal phase, the male wasp choose a hole in the cyconia, cyconia wall to facilitate the exit of the female wasp. The female wasp fly from that fig to another fig following the volatile profile. So here the male is wingless, so it lives and dies inside the cyconia. In our lab, the volatile profile of the fig is known, but the olfactory receptors that are perceiving the volatiles are not known. So we are interested in finding the olfactory receptors of the fig wasp and also we wanted to see the gene ex expression across tissues. And also in our previous study, we found that there is a difference in the volatile profile across regions in India. So we would like to know whether ORs track this variation or not. With this interest, we sequenced the whole genome of C. fusiceps Using hybrid sequencing method, we used Illumina and AX4 nanophore uh, for our genome sequencing purpose. And uh, these are some statistics of sequencing. Totally, we got 80 GB data from the uh, Illumina and uh, from nanophore, we got 8 GB data. And we have performed a Masurka hybrid assembly. So according to the uh, assembly statistics, we have got very good N50 value uh, as explained in the previous talk. It's 4.1 MB uh, N50 value and the scaffold generated 1,286. The reduced scaffolds and reduced contigs are because of the uh, high N50 values. So we got 237.9 MB genome for this species. And we have validated this assembly using the read mappings and the BASCO analysis. We have got nearly 98% of BASCO, uh, complete BASCO. And uh, this um, uh, short reads and long reads uh, assembly mapping was also more than 90%. And the nanopore mapping is more than 80%. So we compared this genome was with the congeneric species, Ceratosolan solum C, that is the pollinator of Ficus hispida that has been already published. So we found that 4,450 uh, gene clusters are common among these two species. And on comparison of uh, other hymenopteran genomes, we found that the genome size that we have assembled is uh, acceptable with the other hymenopteran genomes and the number of genes annotated were also acceptable. And since, since our second objective is to uh, understand the expression of the olfactory receptor genes in the um, uh, different tissues of the wasp, we have done transcriptome sequencing for that. The fig wasp, uh, uh, the figs were um, bagged in the primordial stage to avoid the random uh, entry of the wasp inside the cyconia. And then we introduced one single female foundress inside the cyconia. And then we collect the uh, offspring uh, wasp from single mother. And then we dissected uh, the wasp into seven tissues. And then we isolated the RNA, did the RNA sequencing. We obtained 312 million reads and more than 87 percentage reads are of good quality. And then we used a genome guided transcriptome assembly and uh, the, we got 58,076 uh, transcripts with the N50 value of 1420. And from that, uh, we have annotated 63 ORs, uh, uh, which are annotated from the genome has been compared with the uh, transcriptome assembly also. And the phylogenetic analysis was carried out uh, with the other six hymenopteran ORs that revealed that uh, the C. fusiceps ORs are uh, well aligning with the other hymenopteran ORs and also closely related with the congeneric species Ceratosolum solum C. After that, we wanted to see the expression profile. So we have generated an expression matrix and uh, uh, um, constructed a heat map. In this heat map, you can see that most of the olfactory genes are expressed in the antenna, but there are some genes expressed in the other tissues as well. For example, if you take the wings, one of the olfactory receptor gene is expressed highly, but that is not expressed in the antenna. 
Similarly, in several other tissues also, we are finding some specifically expressed tissue specific expressed genes. And also there is a variation among uh, a variation across the region. So this the first lane is the uh, South Indian uh, sample and the second lane is the North, Northeast Indian sample. We can see the variation across the region also. So this interesting uh, OR uh, variation in OR expression uh, was validated further with the qPCR. So we have selected certain representative genes in such a way that uh, one of the genes showing equal expression in both the regions and one other gene is showing high expression in one region and low expression in another region. So we have done five biological replicates and we found the similar pattern that we have observed in the heat map. So uh, the, uh, with this, we, we are uh, certainly saying that there are variation in the OR expression across region and there are some uh, tissue specific olfactory receptor gene expression also. So with that, I would like to summarize my uh, talk. Uh, we have annotated the, uh, we have assembled the CFUCCEP uh, genome and 63 ORs were annotated. And the RNA-seq revealed that ORs are expressed in non olfactory tissues as well. And it is, uh, variation is observed across uh, geographical regions. Um, that uh, corroborates our previous observation with the variation in the volatile organic compound profile. And also uh, the expression of ORs exclusively to non olfactory tissues might indicate a role in the OV position inside the psychonium. So with that, I would like to acknowledge Professor Rene M. Borges, who is my boss and uh, guiding me in the ecological aspect. And Dr. Ewald Grossi, uh, this my special thanks to him. He's the man behind all these uh, genomic and transcriptomic work. And uh, Professor Saudamini, NCBS, and her student, Dr. Snehal, currently she is a postdoc uh, in Brussels and she is a collaborator in this work. My special thanks to Snehal also and Hitesh uh, who, who helped me in all the uh, bioinformatics analysis and all my other lab, my lab mates for sample collection. And this work project has been funded by Department of Biotechnology and this work has been carried out in IIC, Max Planck and NCBS. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Sushma. Um, we are two minutes behind, so I, I think um, we're going to keep the questions for the end so that we keep on time for now. Um, so attendees, please keep the questions coming, but we're going to move on now uh, to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you keep for keeping in time with your own talk. And I'm seeing some really lovely emerging themes for the discussion at the end on when you need to smell, what you do with overposition. So I'm looking forward to that part. But mm -hmm. having discussed something at the moment that has possibly no wings, we're going to go for even further simplification with the next talk, which is from Lars Potsielowski on a parasitic crustacean. Thank uh, you. So Shma, you need to stop uh, sharing your screen. Thanks. So, hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I think you should see my presentation now. Um, Everything okay? Yes, looks yep. great. So, I will talk about a side project of us, which is uh, about the genome of Sacolina carcini, which is an endoparasitic crustacean from the cirripede groups. So, as you all might know Darwin spent a lot of years uh, describing and analyzing cirripedes, and you all might know them, all those Aiken barnacles sitting on the rocks of, of all the seashores. But Darwin largely neglected the, the parasitic groups, the parasitic relatives here from the group of the Rhizocephalans, which is a few hundred species of endoparasites. And well, early on when I studied biology, they fascinated me because they are the most strikingly derived arthropods you can think of. So because they have no legs, they have no appendages at all, no sense organs, no internal organs. Actually, Sacculina just um, consists of two parts of the body. One is externally visible. The, the, the host of this parasite is a short crab, so don't be confused, it's another crustacean. And so you see the out, outer part here is a breeding sac, which is just a sac of epithelium with a few muscle cells and nerve cells and just bearing the gonads. While the main part of the body is inside of the host and consists of a very simple tissue type. It's just epidermal tubes that, that reach many parts of the body of the host. So there are no internal organs like gut or excretory system or 
anything else or the, the maximum reduced morphology you can assume. The host is affecting the, uh, the, the parasite is affecting the host by suppression of gonad development and suppression of ectysis. So it will not kill the host, but it is a parasitic castrator and it just exploits all nutrients coming from the host and also has effects on the behavior of the host. So we started this sequencing project five or more years ago and first of all with the classical Illumina approach with paired ends and mate pairs and that was clearly horrible. The genome is not really big, it's roughly less than 500 million base pairs, but it seems to be completely full of repeats and, and transposable elements and so therefore we needed to wait for the long read technology to be there to, to get an idea about the, the genome assembly at all. So. Sequencing this with Oxford Nanopore to 40x coverage and yeah, doing long read assembly with fly in WTDBG and polishing this with uh, Illumina reads and doing some additional scaffolding with the mate pairs we, we just had and with long reads at all. We did the typical annotation steps. So we did repeat model our masker and we additionally sequenced transcriptomes from those tissue types and yeah, to, to enhance the, the protein coding gene prediction, which we did with fun annotate, which is quite versatile. So the reason for our obstacles to get a good genome assembly are quite clear. So you see the, the assembly we have now has about 60% of repeat elements, some of them in really high abundance. And so this, this was the main reason why the Illumina alone assembly had no chance for us. So we also took this uh, repeat landscape to analyze how complete the assembly now might be to using a tool which was just published last year, the VIETE, which compares for specific um, repeat families, the abundance in the raw data and the abundance at the assembly. And we see from the expect value here, the black line, you see ours is not really the same, but it's close. So that means uh, it is still a bit underestimated for many repeat families, but it's not so different from, from the possible real genome. <laughs> um, yeah, gene prediction went also quite well. So we have good Fusco values. We have here a comparison of some other crustaceans. Some insects are also here and other arthropods. And we see the, the dark blues are genes that are shared by all the groups. Uh, the light blue here is so shared by all arthropods. We have some syrupid specific genes here in Saculina and in an Aiken barnacle genome, the only other syrupid that is available. And as we know from other projects, a lot of lineage specific proteins will be assigned here. I can just highlight a few things. So coming back to the Hox genes with that were beautifully introduced by, by Peter Holland before. There were old stories done in the PCR age and with antibody staining that the syrupids may have lost abdominal A, which is also responsible for the right development of an abdomen. And as the syrupids have lost the abdomen or which is largely reduced. It was always thought that this is a kind of macro mutation that, that led to, to this derived body plan. And so there was a chance now to check if this is the case. So we could analyze the whole Hox gene cluster, which is on, on one big scaffold here. And indeed we see that abdominal A is missing in the same way as with the Hox3 group, so with the 10 genes that Peter mentioned. So at least it's missing from the Hox gene cluster. That doesn't mean it's not here in, in, in the genome. And if we analyze all the genes for, for homeobox domains, we actually find two genes which are placed on different scaffolds here, which cluster with abdominal A and UBX. So maybe there was a gene duplication before abdominal A was lost from the Hox gene cluster. And that's important because there is also expression known from, from later stages in neurogenesis and so on. So it might be important that it is not lost at all. The second thing I want to Two mention minutes. is, yeah, uh, the, the novelty of this internal part of the parasite with this rootlet tissue, this is something new, it's an evolutionary novelty. And so we wanted to know with the 
getting a differential transcription profile from the internal and external part, which genes are important in, in, in this organ system. So I will not go too much into details, but um, I can list some highlights. So many of the genes that are upregulated in the internal tissue are, have something to do with uptake of nutrients. So we have genes that are responsible for lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, proteolysis. We have a lot of transporters in the cellular membranes that transport nutrients into uh, the parasite. And there are some secreted things like protein as inhibitors that may somehow reduce the immune reaction of the host towards the parasite. And what also is quite interesting is there is upregulation of a neurohormone called CHH, which is the crustacean hypoglycemic hormone, which is important to suppress ectasis and gonad development, just as we heard that parasite does, and also elevates the sugar level in hemolymph, which also helps the parasite to, to take more sugar up by itself. And so with that hints, I will just thank my group at Museum König and also at the University of Bonn and some cooperators across uh, Europe and the funding agency, the German Science Foundation. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, one very, very quick question directly. Um, given that you, this little guy doesn't really have much of a body, <laughs> why does it need Hox genes? <laughs> well, the, the larvae are the, the ones that look like arthropods. So that's the, the reason why early on, when they describe this species, they, they see, okay, they have nauplius larvae like other crustaceans. They have cypress larvae, which is similar to, to the ones of the Aiken barnacles. And these larvae mm -hmm. have appendages, they have, yeah, things the other And I, I suppose everything has to have a front and a back and a, and a, yes. so, and a so top and a tail. Yes, the larvae is a bilaterian <laughs> animal, but the, the rest is not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. There were a couple of other questions, but we'll save those for the end. Thank you. Um, just as a quick comment from the next speaker, um, your talk has been voted for having the most disturbing organism of the session so far if we wanted to make that a new kind of competition. But moving from a simple arthropod, the next talk is by Julie dunning Potop, who will be talking about Wolbachia and lateral gene transfer. And I have like the least disturbing organism, at least I think that most of you guys will consider. Okay, there we go. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, sorry. Second. Okay, so I'm going to be talking. I am not going to mention Hox genes in my talk at all. Um, just brought that. I just like to put that out there for everybody. Um, but I'm going to be talking about genomics and transcriptomics of lateral gene transfers in Drosophila ananasiae, uh, which is my favorite bug. So, just for anybody who doesn't know what lateral gene transfer is, it's what happened to Peter Parker that made him Spider Man. Um, at least according to the movies, maybe not according to the comic books. Um, but, you know, Peter Parker uh, received DNA from that spider, and that uh, DNA that he received uh, enabled him to have some of his spidey abilities. Um, and so that transfer of DNA between diverse organisms in the absence of true sex um, is lateral gene transfer, which is also synonymous with horizontal gene transfer. Uh, and over the past decade um, and more, uh, we really understand that there's a lot of advantageous gene transfers in eukaryotic genomes. And so I give two examples here. One is the transfer of carotenoid biosynthetic genes to aphids from fungi that gives it a color polymorphism that helps in defense. And the other is the acquisition <clears throat> excuse me, of mannanase genes from a bacteria in the coffee berry borer, which may allow it to parasitize coffee berries as opposed to its sister taxa. But there are many more, uh, and those results go back further, uh, even further when you look at, uh, at nematodes and plant parasitic nematodes. So um, just a disclaimer, we use arthropods and nematodes to study genomes. Um, so my interest isn't particularly in the arthropod, but in understanding genomes uh, and, and genomics. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a fly. Um, it's very exciting. It has wings, legs, eyes, and a head. It grows in the lab most of the time. It's not the most 
rigorous uh, grower <laughs> in the lab. Uh, the line we're going to use is very inbred. It was used in the original genome sequencing project for Drosophila ananasiae, and we continue to use it. Uh, so in other words, it's a really great model system. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it also has polyteen chromosomes, which is also a great um, thing for us to be able to use. Uh, and it uh, naturally contains a Wolbachia endosymbiont W. Anna. Um, but most of the results I'm going to talk about today um, are from a cured line, we call it CHI, uh, that was cured in our lab over a decade ago using tetracycline, and we routinely test it to make sure that there is no Wolbachia uh, in it. So um, Drosophila ananasiae has some interesting genomic features that you may or may not know about. It has a large heterochromatic chromosome 4. So chromosome 4 in, in most Drosophila, including Melanogaster, is referred to as the dot chromosome because it's very small, uh, about 5 megabases, and it, it kind of appears as a dot when you do microscopy. Uh, it's much larger in Drosophila ananasiae. It's been compared in size based on microscopy to the size of the X chromosome. Um, and so that places it more, but it is much larger, somewhere maybe 20 to 40 megabases. Uh, and uh, one of the other interesting genomic features is that Drosophila ananasiae has active mobile elements. So um, this just shows the polyteens of Drosophila ananasiae that um, are known. Uh, this is from the 1993 uh, book by Matsuda on Drosophila ananasiae. And um, you will see that, like, the, that we are able to, these, these are our assemblies that we were able to put together. So most of the time we were able to assemble a complete arm, uh, plus usually at least portions of the pericentromere. In one case, case, we were able to assemble the complete chromosome. And we have pretty high confidence in these assemblies because the, they match the cytogenetic results with the polyteen chromosomes. Uh, there is an inversion in chromosome 3 down in the bottom left, but that was known in this line and was also seen in the Sanger-based uh, original sequencing project. So I'm showing you chromosomes 2, 3, and X because they're largely assembled. Chromosome 4 is not nearly as well assembled. Um, so I compared chromosome 4 to chromosome X. Chromosome X we have as three contigs spanning about 45 megabases. Chromosome 4, we have 22 contigs we believe that are part of chromosome 4, spanning about 28 megabases. Um, I have less than 1,000 years old. That's not referring to chromosome 4. That's actually referring to the massive amounts of Wolbachia DNA that are actually in chromosome 4. Um, so one of the things that we have been able to identify uh, based on microscopy, and you can see that image on the left. I don't know if my cursor is going to work. But you can see this is chromosome 4 here, this V-shaped chromosome. And these pink spots are actually where it's lighting up with probes uh, to Wolbachia DNA. Um, using this cured line, we estimate that 2% of the Drosophila ananasia genome is actually derived from Wolbachia DNA um, that's less than 1,000 years old. Um, that's using a Lumina read counting, um, so it's, not, it's an assembly independent process. And uh, there is more than 5 megabases of Wolbachia sequence. So the Wolbachia genome is about 1.4 megabases. So most of the, all of the Wolbachia genome is there once. Most of it's there twice. Some of it's there, it looks like, up to 6 or 8 times. Um, so tremendous amounts of Wolbachia DNA. It's been duplicated um, and pretty extensive. And if you'd like to learn more about that, uh, please check out Eric Tweet's poster. He's a postdoc in my group, and he has a V poster as well as a Zoom room tomorrow to talk about that. Um, this, some of you might find this overwhelming, and I promise I'll, I'll bring you back on the next slide if you find this overwhelming. Uh, this is a mummer plot of the uh, contigs we attribute to the lateral gene transfer relative to the Wolbachia genome. So along the x-axis, you have the Wolbachia reference genome. So this is the 1.4 megabase sequences. And along the y-axis, we have all the Drosophila ananasia contigs that match that Wolbachia genome. Um, oops. Um, if, I'm sorry. Um, if there's red or blue, it's just signifying there's a match between the Wolbachia genome and the Drosophila genome in those two locations. Those pink horizontal lines are actually where the sequence is of Drosophila ancestry. Um, and so the big pink bars are actually junctions between the chromosome 
um, and the lateral gene transfer. There are four of those junctions, so we think there's at least two locations that hold Wolbachia DNA in chromosome four. Um, and then those small pink lines are actually all the retrotransposons. And they are what allowed us to finally be able to put this together. So that combined with ultra long reads, both from the SQL2 platform and ONT's ligation as well as RAD sequencing, um, combined with those transposable elements. Because we can now go, many of these transposable elements are unique insertions. So we can go from one unique transposable element insertion to the next. So if you're interested in transposable elements, this might be a great system um, because we can actually um, see a lot of things that you might be interested in that uh, we're not looking at. So feel free to talk to us about that. So if that didn't make sense to you, I'm just going to zoom in on one region. This is a region that we had shown previously um, in a publication, but we now have much greater clarity about what's going on. So at the bottom, I'm showing you the genes in the uh, Wolbachia of Drosophila melanogaster, and this is the actual Wolbachia genome. Above that, I'm showing you the genes in the Wolbachia of Drosophila ananasiae, and again, this is the Wolbachia genome. Um, and then the three above are three different variants that we identified in the Drosophila ananasiae genome. So the one in the middle looks very much like the WANA genome. There are some differences. There appears to be maybe a deletion or something, um, but they look very similar. Um, but when you look at these other ones, these white boxes are actually transposable elements that have inserted. Uh, and so you can see there are actually three different transposable elements that have all inserted in this location. And this is one thing that we're finding that we don't completely understand, but transposable elements seem to be preferring particular locations in the sequence. And we don't know why that is. Um, is there some sort of sequence that makes it more amenable for the transposable element to land there? Or are they doing things like bringing in promotion? or bringing in origins of replication, because we kind of need some origins of replication for Drosophila. Are they bringing in something that helps pack the DNA, like sites that can bring in histones? We don't know, but there seems to be, um, they seem to come to the same locations. And it could be a combination of all those things. It could be something else like we haven't thought about. Um, and then this just so shows transcription. One minute, one minute, please. Right. Okay, this is my last slide, so that's good. Um, so this actually just shows transcription. So we have thought that we could see transcription with short reads, um, but it was always very hard to tell for sure, and we were always worried about contamination. Uh, here with long reads, we are much more convinced that we actually have transcription of these lateral gene transfers. You can actually see these are the actual some of the reads down here at the bottom. You can actually see that these reads are being spliced. Uh, we still don't know if they're functional. This could just be happening. Um, but um, we do think we see transcription. Uh, if you want to know more, I'm hosting a Zoom room this afternoon. You can also check out Eric's poster and his Zoom room tomorrow. Um, we've been lucky to be funded on these projects, um, and most of this work has been funded by my NIH Transformative Research Award, as well as our NIAID U19. Uh, and I have a fabulous group that supports my work, and um, most of this is by Eric right here, who's attending the conference, and Ben, who's sitting next to him. Uh, and thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Julie. So there's a, a couple of questions about uh, distinguishing contamination from real LGT, which I think we should avoid getting into directly here. <laughs> but I'm very pleased to hear that you're um, hosting a, a discussion group afterwards, because I hope that all of these people who are asking these questions will join you um, to have an in-depth discussion about those. Um, so just very, very briefly, um, do you think that uh, the, the number of integrations or the successfulness of integrations correlates with the activity level, TE activity level in species? And have you been able to, to show that? No, I mean, we don't have a good comparator to be able to show that. And what I don't know is, um, you know, if this went into a, an insect that didn't have all this transposable element activity, it'd be really hard to distinguish it from a Wolbachia genome. Yeah. And so I think the transposable elements have actually helped us be able to see it and to understand it and to actually be able to sequence it. Because I think it's actually the largest repeat in an animal genome. Um, like, I, I don't, if anybody knows of a larger one, I, I don't, I, I'd be interested to know. Um, but okay. I think, um, I think that's really the, the key. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, and our final speaker of this first session is Kim Ferguson, who will be taking us back to looking at other aspects of wasps. Great. Just one second. 
So I have five minutes to convince you all to get hyped for a genome assembly method that is no longer possible. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, thanks for the introduction. And I'm going to talk about the genome of Bracom vivicornis, as well as the putative complementary sex determiner gene. So first of all, I'll give a brief rundown of complementary sex determination in uh, haplodiploid systems. Sex determination is generally through diploid is female and haploid is male. And this is through unfertilized eggs or fertilized eggs. That's the general thing. But there's additional complications that can happen. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about complementary sex determination, specifically uh, in Bracon brevicornis, the species that I'm talking about. You have uh, an additional thing where a region, the single locus, in this case, single locus CSD, needs to be heterozygous, and then it will be a female. And if it's hemizygous, it's a male. However, if the region of the CSD is uh, diploid, or sorry, is homozygous, then you get a diploid male, and these aren't that great. Some call it a dead-end system, where these diploid males, they have reduced fitness, they generally are not very uh, productive, or they're sterile, even in some cases. So when it comes to sex determination, it's kind of a question of like, why does this system persist, and how is it functional? And from a biocontrol perspective, this can be very irritating when you're rearing uh, population suddenly goes into a direction where you have a lot of diploid males and you don't want that. So the question then, when we were approaching this for Bracon was how are we going to figure out this sex determination system? So it's very well studied in the honeybee for the CSD mechanism. You can see here, essentially where the CSD region is heterozygous, complementary sex determination is turned on and you get a female splice variant for a fem, feminizer and this regulates. In terms of other hymenopterans, the transformer system, you can see here the CSD is a duplication of feminizer, which in turn is an ortholog of transformer, a splicing factor. This is well uh, studied in terms of what needs to be present, this hymenoptera specific domain, domain, but the actual gene and the mechanism of control is a bit uncertain. So it's kind of like, how does it work in other hymenoptera? We don't know. And so we have to study that. It's difficult though, when you try to do it at a genome level because heterozygosity is both the key and the problem. So for the system, heterozygosity is the key, but for genome assemblies, that is a problem, especially because genome assemblies often flatten to a haploid assembly and everything becomes a single line. So our approach was to do a diploid genome, a phase genome. So we did this with the 10X Genomics platform, which is no longer available for genome assembly. <laughs> I'll just say that now. I know it's not available anymore. I'm sorry, rip uh, 10X Genomics. Uh, but the method really helped us because we needed a low amount of input DNA and then we were able to create a phase genome. So we did this using females from a fairly inbred population. We knew they were heterozygous at their CSD because they were females. And here are the genome statistics if you're interested. Maybe you really wanted to know the busco, there you go. But we wanted to know more because we couldn't find transformer or feminizer in the genome, and this happens a lot. So we looked at these pseudo-haploid arms, and this is a method that is in the, the assembly software, Supernova, and it can create these fake haploids, uh, haploid arms in one and two for each scaffold that will show you areas of heterozygosity. So that's what we looked for, for we blasted for transformer feminizer, and that's what we found. So in a region that was originally annotated as a fusion protein, we found what looks to be feminizer and a duplication, which we call BBFEM1. So you can see the yellow in this graph is a heterozygosity and then green is identity. So this is what we're thinking. We would say like, yes, we did a syntony analysis comparing to the APIS CSD as well as the transformer from the Sonia in the region and it looks good. So we're kind of confident to say that this BBFEM paralog, BBFEM1, is a good CSC gene candidate in Bracon brevicornis, but we need more proof. But for now, uh, I dropped the link to the preprint in the chat, and you can see it there as well. So that was actually preprinted like today, so that was like excellent timing. Um, and yeah, 
thanks to everyone who helped us out with this project. It was really like a, a bit of a moonshot because we just had a tiny bit of funding left and we wanted to see if this could work and it did work. And I'm really sad that it can't be done for others, but maybe other linked read technology that is not 10X can be part of the solution here. Cause this was the perfect answer to the problem that we had. So, and that's it. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I think that's uh, fascinating how um, different technologies are better suited to answer particular types of questions, isn't it? Yes. And how very okay. quickly it changes. Yes, indeed. Yes. <clears throat> um, okay, so we are only at ever so slightly um, over schedule, but uh, this means that we can now pose a few questions to uh, all the speakers at the end. Um, and I'd like to start with Peter, Peter Holland. Um, so uh, Yannick Verm is asking, if he if he was seeing double or triple, uh, was that really a 19-fold increase in the copy number of some of those genes? And if there are other species that are aquatic, have you seen similar changes that have occurred there? Um, yes, it was a it was a tandem duplication. Uh, 16 copies of one of the SHX genes. Um, we we have collected the related species. So they haven't been sequenced yet. So we we will we will know that in in time. We just don't know yet. Okay, good. And and were they selected uh, with this in mind, or is this like so fresh that uh, they were already selected? Um, we were going to select them anyway, but we we made, no we we did make a special effort to go and look for the aquatic the other aquatic species once we'd seen this duplication in one species. So, yeah. Okay, and almost a follow up. Uh, to that from uh, Andrew Mung. Um, he's asking, is there anything that, looking at whether the Hox gene expansion in Bombix has something to do with um, their domestication and associated morphology changes? Do you know if anything in that direction? Yeah, well, I don't know. Other people may know that. I mean, that, um, there are, you know, it's in a, it's in a, a family with many other silk moths, um, wild silk moths, but I, we haven't sequenced another silk moth genome. We only have one species of silk moth in the UK anyway, and it doesn't exist at Whiteham Woods, unless we attract it a long way with a pheromone, um, <laughs> which we'll try. Um, but yeah, so, so we don't know is the, is the answer to that. Okay. Um, and, and following up with uh, on the theme of sampling, um, for those of us less familiar, you know, with the, the sort of tree that you showed us at the beginning, um, how far back in time are we going there to the last common ancestor of the species that you're selecting? That, the tree I showed you um, is all the Lepidoptera plus Caddis okay. plus Fly out group. Uh, the duplications of the Hox genes that we're seeing don't actually cover all Lepidoptera. The, the most basal lineages, the very most basal lineages don't have those SHX genes, um, but we are currently sampling more of those lineages to actually map down when the duplications happened. So it's okay. within the map doctor. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, for uh, Sushma, if uh, you can unmute to then respond. Um, we have a question here from Antonella. Um, do you think that the transcriptomic differences that you see between uh, the species, from, uh, the individuals from different regions could be in fact indicating that you have different species? Yeah, could you please uh, start my video? Yeah, so uh, we have the data for uh, these species, uh, morphological data and uh, genetic marker data. According to those previous data, uh, uh, those two species are same. There is no cryptic species. Both are safe use sets only. And there is no cryptic species we have observed, but even then the variation is interesting for us to further explore. Okay, and a follow-up to that. Um, do you have any hypotheses about those um, uh, ORs that are being expressed in the wing that were very clearly highly expressed in the wing? What yeah, are they doing there? <laughs> um, we, we think that this uh, wasp has a very short lifespan, one day to fly to the another fig tree and pollinate and oviposite. So it's a very tiny wasp. Uh, so in order to uh, perfectly identify the specific host, uh, it may have additional or olfactory receptor in the wings uh, in order to expand its surface area for the olfaction. Uh, 
that is what we are guessing but we have to find out the actual function of that gene okay thank you <clears throat> thank you um for lars now um we have a question about uh, this idea of uh, parasites and genome size reduction so uh, many parasites have relatively smaller genomes than free living organisms so for um, your species is it uh, smaller than its closest relatives or uh, is it smaller than other known free living crustaceans no not really so the the the, the other sea repeats the the uh, that live attached on on rock surfaces and so on have genome sizes in in that range or even smaller so like 300 million up to 600 800 so there is not much difference although they were parasites by probably more than 100 million years now so so there is no trend towards this but we have this great expansion of of repeat elements that, that clearly push up the genome size or yes. keep it on a high level. Were you of surprised course. by that, given that often if you have a small body and you're a parasite, you tend to reduce your genome? You see that, for example, maybe with particulates and others in the insects? Yeah, that was one starting question that if, if somehow genes are reduced, so that was the initial idea, but it, it doesn't look like that. So there are gene families that are smaller, but others have expanded and so, so there is a high turnover of of genes, I guess, and also a lot of new genes that are not known from, from other organisms. So, And they don't mind to carry along all that repetitive content in their tiny little bodies. Well, they're not so tiny, so so they, they grow in, inside the, the host, so, so there, there are several grams of, of tissue in, inside, actually. <laughs> all right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, for Julie, uh, in, in terms of the biology of the fly, um, the flies that you cured of Wolbachia, um, what effect did it have uh, on their uh, behavior, biology, physiology? I mean, did they, did they suddenly look like they were much, much happier or were they sad? Um, yeah, you know, we haven't done competition assays, um, but anecdotally we have harder, a harder time keeping them alive uh, in the lab than their um, uncured. Now, is that an effect of the microbiome um, and the fact that we would have destroyed the microbiome with all this doxycycline treatment, which happened over three generations, um, or is that an effect of losing the Wolbachia? We don't really know, and we haven't we haven't tried to do that. Okay, and then back to the genome uh, side of questioning. Um, so you clearly have a very um, nice, precise system where you can be really sure of it, but how uh, often are you seeing confident Wolbachia integrations across all available arthropod genomes? Yeah, so we've looked at with Illumina and I feel like there's so many artifacts and, and things that it's hard to really tell. Um, I think if people are open-minded and don't start with a contamination removal step uh, in their assemblies, the contaminants will fall out as their own context. <laughs> And we'll be able to begin to see these. We'll be able to see if there's other bacteria who do this besides Wolbachia. Um, I think, you know, in nematodes, particularly filarial nematodes, people have done that. Um, and, you know, we really see that all filarial nematodes have Wolbachia DNA integrations of some sort. There, they're smaller, so it, it's a little easier to do. Um, whereas in insects where we have, you know, the, many of the ones that have been described by me or other groups are entire bacterial genomes. I think it's much harder, much harder. Yeah, definitely. And I'm sure you will discuss a lot more further in your uh, Skype conversation later. Um, a methodolog methodological question for uh, Kim um, about, from Amanda Stalker, any idea if the haplotype tagging method, and there's a paper in a preprint in BioArchive um, highlighted by the Darwin Tree of Life project yesterday, if uh, this haplotype tagging method can also uh, identify or produce these pseudo haplotypes that were so, I mean, that we, you were really hunting for. Yeah, this is this is perfect. So I had to miss yesterday, so I was just reading over this paper now, and this they essentially are like, look, we've solved the issue of 10x not offering genomes. So 
it could work. Uh, it just depends. So I have to see one 10x genome that we did, a different one. We specifically chose it because we had a very low amount of high quality input DNA. We did it from a single insect. So I would have to see, is the amount of high molecular weight DNA going to be a limiting factor? Because that was another benefit of the 10x library prep. But you could also use carrier DNA like we did in this study. We used tomato to be the carrier for the reaction. So I think, Amanda, uh, quickly skimming it, I think like the the authors are very confident that this, this is a good uh, workaround and I would agree. And I think it would be great to see future projects pick it up. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's always uh, difficult to keep uh, abreast of all of these new technologies. So uh, this is uh, excellent that people are discussing them here. Um, so now to go back to speaker number one, Isabel. Um, uh, we have a question here from Nico. Uh, do you have any data on uh, what cell types uh, might be doing the smelling in the in the gills? No. So so far, the only thing we know is that so some of them call up, so have an HRP staining. So probably they are kind of a yeah neuron like uh, cell types, but apart from that, we don't know anything. So what we, so another, in another project, of, another project in the lab, so we are going to do single cell of the gill plates. So probably we will get the full answer to that, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Uh, yeah. smelling, un smelling underwater, uh, <laughs> how does it work and, and who's doing it? Yes. Um, perhaps a, a, a more methodological question uh, now for you. Um, obviously, there wasn't much time in the talk to go into that, but um, could you perhaps explain how you identified which expression modules were defined as equivalent between the different species, especially given the large evolutionary distances between the fly and the mayfly, even though they both got fly in their name? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so I think that the important thing here was how we define the modules. Because so because so at, at the end we have modules with with the names like are just like green orange and so we need so we needed to go back to the to the expression data so some in some cases it was clear that there was one tissue or one of the samples that have like really high expression in comparison to the others in other cases it was just more um, looking at the geoterms and we could just select like it was not an, a unique sample, but there were several samples, but the geoterms were like uh, trachea related or more like mitochondria. So we could uh, assign these uh, modules. And then for the pairwise comparison, I think we use a uh, hypergeometric uh, statistical test. So mm -hmm. on ortholog sharing. Yes, yeah? uh, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the uh, orthologs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I guess this this follows that uh, the same theme. Um, uh, Catherine asking which genes particularly are driving this high correlation between the gill and the wing transcriptomes. Uh, so they are they are mostly genes uh, related to epithelial development or function, basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good. Uh, we are now reaching the end of our schedule. And because we have another Eco Evo session uh, and we need to have a little breathe in between, uh, Kristen, uh, would you have any last questions? Uh, otherwise, uh, feel free to uh, close the sure. session. Um, no, I, well, I, I have many, many questions and so do many of the other participants. And it's really great to see how with all of you having shown so many details from species collection and identification in the field, to some of the technical aspects of how you actually deal with repeats and assembly. Are the genes real? Are the genes missing? Do we have more genes than we expect? To really getting into what those genes are for. I think you'll see in the Slack discussion, a lot of those questions are really getting into how does that fit into the ecological relevance of some of the phenomena that you're seeing. So thanks so much to all of the speakers, actually. That's been a really nice synthesis of a couple of different things and I always enjoy when we see emerging topics and things coming up and again and again across the talks we maybe hadn't expected to see. So with that, I think, yes, everyone can go stretch their legs. Yes. Get a <laughs> coffee or so. And we'll be back with a new Zoom link for the next session in, oh gosh, about 10 minutes, I think.
<laughs> and a reminder um, that at the very end of the day, for those who are available and willing to continue and the discussion, stamina. yes, uh, we, we will uh, be posting a, a Zoom meeting link for whoever's available uh, about 15 minutes after we're finished for the day. And you're all welcome to join, but we completely understand that timings can be tricky. So uh, uh, great. Thank you again. So thanks again everybody. to all the speakers. Yeah. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.